come tonight. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm this one over here, uh, Nick Gartier, and Steve will is running my computer right now, and I'll run his when he stands up. Um, so we, we want to talk to you about uh, the Kepler mission, what it is, why it is, uh, what we found out, and uh, we split this up into two parts. I'm going to talk about, I'm going to give the introduction to the Kepler mission and tell you about some of the exoplanet stuff that we found. And then Steve is going to tell you about kind of the other half of the Kepler results, which is the astrophysics uh, that, that Kepler does. And uh, you should, um, if there's something that you don't understand while we're talking, you, I think you should ask the questions while we're talking. So feel free to do that with me. And I think Steve probably has the, the same. So let's see. Um, the Kepler mission is, is, is an attempt by, uh, by NASA and a, 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 a group of, of American and international scientists to find habitable planets uh, beyond the Earth. And is this working? It is working. So I'm going to start by talking a little bit about what a habitable planet is. It might look like this one. <laughs> um, and habitable plants, we think, probably have about the right temperature. And we think they need to have liquid water on them. And you can discuss this point with me or Steve or, or any of our Kepler guys over here after this. But the reason we're picking this instead of, you know, say, liquid chlorine or something like that, that science fiction people might think of, is because we know that works. And we know how to, how to look for it. So uh, we think that's a good place to start. Uh, it needs to have an atmosphere, probably, so that you, you don't have, you know, have your life trying to be exposed to vacuum space. Uh, there would be issues of, you know, whether you need gases like oxygen to do metabolism, but also you don't want uh, temperature extremes or, uh, or, you know, ionizing radiation um, disturbing your life. Now, these two are obviously uh, connected because if the temperature is wrong, water is not going to be liquid on the surface. So um, another thing that, uh, that, that habitable <coughs> plants probably need are they have to be the right size. Again, the issue of habitability in a big planet like, like Jupiter, where you, you have you know, a giant deep atmosphere because the gravity is holding on to, to all the gases that it was made from, you could potentially have life there. But again, we know that this kind of planet can support life. So that's the one we're looking for. Also, we kind of like this and we want to find out if there are Earths around. Um, so there are planets that are just right, something like between half an Earth mass and 10 Earth mass, which can hold on to the heavier gases, still leave an atmosphere, but a thin atmosphere compared to the gas giant. Um, and then there are planets that are too small, uh, less than about half an Earth mass, like the Moon or Mercury, that just can't hold onto an atmosphere for a significant amount of time, and we wouldn't necessarily expect life to evolve there. So this leads to the concept of the habitable zone, the subject of one of the earlier questions, what is called the Goldilocks zone. So there's a region, a certain distance from, from a, a star, where the, the sort of the equilibrium temperature of the planet is going to be in, in the, the range between the freezing point and the boiling point of water. And for, for hot stars, stars that are heavier than the sun and that are going to be hotter than the sun, the, the habitable zone is, is larger. And it will, uh, will be, um, planets in the habitable zone will have orbits longer than a year, maybe quite a bit longer than a year. For sunlight stars, the habitable zone, well, OK, I've shown the habitable zone in green here in the region that's too cold and blue in the region that's too hot in red. The habitable zone is something like uh, the orbit of Venus out to a little bit around the orbit of Mars. So it has periods between 150 days or so and uh, a year and a half. Uh, for cooler stars, they have less, they're lower temperature stars, less radiation, so the habitable zone uh, is, is compressed closer to the star. So next thing I want to talk about is how we, how we find exoplanets. Um, there have been a lot of them found uh, up, up to now, um, and there's two principal ways to do it. You can look at the effect of the, uh, the, the stars, uh, I mean the planet's mass on, on its star. The two are going around each other, uh, well, if you think about the, the 
happening. The planet going around the star, but that's not really what's happening. Both the planet and the star are, are in orbit around their, the, the sort of the center, gravi center of gravity between them. So the planet is yanking the star around as it goes around in its orbit. And you, if you measure the velocity of the star with respect to Earth, you can see it moving back and forth. The speed, the speed of the star relative to the Earth changes as it goes around in this circle that's induced by the planet. So a lot of planets have been discovered by the radial velocity method. And when you do that, you can measure the mass of the planet and you get the orbital period of the planet just from the period of the velocity variation. And you can measure the shape of the orbit and, the, and once you know the mass of the star, and we, we know the properties of stars pretty well. Once we identify what kind of star it is and look at its spectrum carefully, we can tell pretty closely what the diameter of the star is and what the mass of the star is, and something about its age. Uh, so you can get the distance of the, uh, the, the planet from the star because you know the star's mass. The other way, the other principal way that planets have been discovered is by watching the, the brightness of the star. And uh, from time to time, a, a planet's orbit, an exoplanet's orbit, will line up in such a way that uh, sometime during its orbit, it passes in front of its star as viewed from the Earth and cuts out a little bit of the light of the star and you can see that if you're, if you're watching the, uh, the brightness of the star very carefully with high precision. And from that, you can get the size of the planet because it blocks out a certain percentage of the starlight and you know how big the star is so you know how big the planet is. You can get the orbital period and the distance from the star because you have a mass of the star and the orbital period. But you can't get the mass of the planet from this method. You can't get the size of the planet from that method. And down here are some other methods that have been less thoroughly applied, and I, I really don't want to talk about those tonight. But I want to talk a little bit more about the, the transit method. And uh, this picture here is actually a picture that I took of the transit of Venus, what was it, four, four years ago, five years ago. The transits of Venus come in pairs, but I'm sure you guys have read all about that. So the last one was a few years ago, and the next one is going to be about 105 years from now. Um, but this is the sort of thing that, that, that Kepler is looking for. I mean, if we could take a picture of the stars, distant stars, which we can't because they're too far away, so their, their angular size is too small, this is what we'd be seeing. And, and we would have, during a transit of a planet, as Venus would block out that much of, of the light from the star. Now, that, in fact, is about a, hun a hundredth of a percent the light is being blocked out um, by Venus on the sun. And that's a very small change in the light. So we have to build a special instrument to, uh, to be able to be that sensitive. And I think I've said all of that stuff. Um, and I have an example of what the, uh, the transit might look like, and Steve has to fire up the smoothie because cool. this thing doesn't do Yeah, thanks. <laughs> no, that was not. <laughs> For those of us that have had trouble with PowerPoint, this makes me so happy. Okay, I've got the move. Oh, I have to do it up there. Okay, sorry. Yeah, but I have to do the cursor there. Okay. Okay.
look at the stars very with a high precision photometry from ground-based telescopes. You have to look at them a lot because a lot of the time because these transits occur only for a few hours out of the period of the planet. So if you're looking for a planet with a period of a year or 30 days or something like that, you only got a couple of hours, six hours, ten hours like that out of that whole period to find the planet. So we have to we have to be looking at the stars all the time. So a good place to do that is from space. Uh, I forgot to say one thing. Um, the ground-based photometric measurements, the highest precision that can really be achieved is something a little bit better than 1%, maybe, maybe a tenth of a percent. But because of the disturbance of the atmosphere, the, the transmission of the atmosphere to the light that's coming from the stars, it's essentially impossible to see the transits of a hundredth of a percent depth that come from Earth-sized planets. So a lot of planets have been, a lot of transiting planets have been found by ground-based observations. No small ones that are Earth-sized. You have to go to space to get the kind of photometric precision that you need to see Earth-sized planets. So, we built the Kepler telescope and launched it into a, a solar orbit. Kepler actually goes is in orbit around the sun, not around the Earth. And this is so we can get the Earth out of the way. So it wouldn't be uh, uh, in orbit around the Earth, you'd have the temperature of the telescope changing and scattered light from the Earth getting into the telescope differently at different times of its orbit. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, and the Earth would get in the way. Of, of, of looking at the stars constantly um, if, if you're near the Earth. So we must cover in the orbit at some distance from the Earth, independently on the sun. The How so far is it from the sun? It's the same, very nearly the same distance as the Earth from the sun, uh, just a tiny bit farther away. So it's in a slightly longer period orbit, one part in 60 longer period orbit. So the Earth will lap Kepler once every 60 years. And the reason we do that is because we don't have to send it very far away. And the more similar the orbit is to the Earth's orbit, the less energy it takes to get there. So we pick the, the easiest orbit that we can put Kepler into. Also, we don't want it going too far away too fast or, or go out of communication range too soon. So we, we wanted to put it in a drift away orbit, but put it away as slowly as we can accurately get. A period of time you're going to lose contact with uh, Yes, we think, well, yes. What really happens is the data rate drops off. So even when it's on the other side of the sun, two astronomical units away, we can still talk to it, but the data rate will be so slow that we can't, well, we'll see in a minute. We'll see why we need a good data rate when I get in the next, next few slides. We built this telescope, it's, for those of you who know what telescopes are, this is a Schmidt camera. Uh, the starlight, we've got, the starlight comes in the front and goes through a special corrector lens that allows us to use a spherical mirror down here on the bottom and focus a good uh, high precision, very wide field image on a, a set of focal plane detectors right here. And that is the actual set of detectors that went into the telescope that gives you the proper scale and everything because of technician from Ball Aerospace <coughs> there, who built the instrument that's putting the focal plane together. So there are 24, yes, 20, 21, 21 of these modules, each of which contains two separate detectors, these charge couple devices like Steve works with, and each of these charge couple devices uh, have two readouts. So there's actually four independent little detectors in there in each one of those modules. Remember this pattern because you're going to see it later. Uh, and I guess you've had time to read, read that stuff over there. Let me let me talk about a couple of things here. First of all, whoops, I didn't want to do that. The uh, three and a half years, we need to see several transits of a planet before we believe it's there. There's a couple of reasons for that. One, if you see one, one transit of the planet, it could be something else, and, 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 and you also can't find out what its period is unless you see at least two. But if you see only two transits of the planet, you don't know that it's the same object necessarily. So you want to get a third transit that is exactly the same period away, and then you're pretty sure you've got all of a, a, a real object that might, it's in a periodic orbit around something. 
And it turns out that the way Kepler was designed, we needed four transits to make sure we were actually seeing a signal from an Earth-sized planet instead of some random noise in the instrument. And that's because Earth-sized transits were so small that we had to build up a signal transit. Bit. That's why it's a three and a half year, um, longer than three and a half year mission. It's fixed pointing, the same part of the sky all the time, because we can't blink, we can't look away, otherwise we're going to miss one of these six hour long or 12 hour long transits in the, in the, uh, you know, the, the month or two months or, or two year period of these things. Or you talked about why it's in a heliocentric orbit. We, we look at 170,000 stars in this field of view, and we take a measurement of, a, of them every half hour, we record that on the, uh, the spacecraft data recorder, and downlink the, these photometric measurements um, every month. Um, and for 512 of the targets, we also take uh, photometric measurements every minute. And that's going to be important for Steve's talk, because that allows us to measure the, the, the vibrations in the atmospheres of some of the stars. Um, so here we go. So we launched the thing <coughs> March 6, 2009, on top of a, a Delta rocket. Okay. And when we got... Sorry, from where? Uh, Cape Canaveral. Because we needed to send it into something like a nearly... Um, nearly equatorial, or Earth equatorial orbit so that we could accelerate ourselves into a uh, orbit in the ecliptic plane of, of the sun. Uh, the other launch site is from Vandenberg that, that well, these days they have other launch sites. But the other uh, canonical launch site was Vandenberg uh, Air Force Base in California, which is used to things, send things into polar orbits. But that's not what we wanted for, uh, for California. So, we got Kepler on orbit and turned it on and started looking at the sky. And you remember that pattern of the, of the CCTs? Well, there it is projected on the sky. You can only measure the stars and look at the stars inside these, these little rectangles. You can't see anything in these um, spaces in between the detectors. We don't care about that because all we need is acreage on the sky to get the number of stars that we need to observe. Um, and so, so we don't care about making pretty pictures, we care about looking at lots of stars. And I forgot to tell you why we want to look at lots of stars. So I'll do that now. As, as I explained, the orbit plane of the, the transiting planet has to line up with the line of sight to the Earth, to the star. Otherwise, you, you never see the planet go in front of the, the star. It turns out that for uh, orbital distances uh, like the Earth, has around the, the sun, for a star the size of the sun, there's only a half percent chance that an orbit of, of any random uh, of planet one AU away from a distant star is going to line up. So if we want to find lots of planets, we have to look at lots of stars because only a few percent of them is going to have are going to have the, uh, the trans planets doing the transiting, even if every star has a planet. So. That's why we look at so many, so we can get a statistical sample and beat down this problem of this, what astronomers call observational selection. All these planets that are out there that we don't get to see because they don't line up right. But if we look at a lot of stars and get the, the statistical number of planets we see, we can infer the, the true number of planets that are out there. So that's what we actually see when, when we take a picture of the Kepler. And We've lined up the images from each of the individual CCTs in the correct position on the sky. So that's what our, our field of view looks like. And here's how big the moon is. So this is about 10 degrees across. These, these gaps in here are about um, half a degree, a little, a little less than that. Um, and we picked postage stamps, little, little, little bits of pixels around 170,000 stars in that picture. And we only record the data from those postage stamps because we can't afford <coughs> to, uh, to record the, uh, the data from all 95 megapixels here. We do not have enough memory on the spacecraft. We don't have enough bandwidth to send that back down. So we actually record data from only about 5% of the speed. And this is only within our own galaxy that is <coughs> He's my straight man. <coughs> this is the field of view, the, the, the volume of space that we're looking at. We're looking out in the direction of the constellation Cygnus, which looks kind of tangent down one of our local spiral arms, 
and the, the brightness of the stars that we pick to observe means that we can look at things out to about 3,000 light years away, and we can look as close as, as you know, the stars are, but there aren't very many stars that are that close. So it's something like a few light years out to 3,000 light years. is this volume of space that Kepler is surveying. And we call that sort of the extended solar neighborhood. And we expect that that's going to be typical of, you know, practically any place in the galaxy except maybe close to the center where other things may be going on. So, now we get to the part about what Kepler has found. First of all, we have over 3,000 planet candidates now with more coming. The website has not been completely updated to all this stuff, but the number is now, what, 3,300? Or you guys, <coughs> every day they come out with a new set of, of uh, plant candidates. Um, now, at this point, I've got to explain what a plant candidate is. Um, there are things, astrophysical things, like eclipsing binary stars out there that can produce changes in the light of the star, like, like transiting planets. And if you have, well, eclipsing binary stars are usually pretty easy to detect. They have a kind of a, a V-shape to, uh, to the dimming and the, and the brightening of the light curve, and, and planets have more like a U-shape. And the uh, depth of a, an eclipsing binary star can be very large. It can be 50% or you know, 20% or something like that, where planets are 1% or a tenth of a percent or a hundredth hundred of a percent. But you can be fooled by eclipsing binary stars because the star you're observing might have a distant eclipsing binary star behind it, which gets confused in the, the Kepler pixel. So the light from the eclipsing binary star is diluted by the light of the star that you're looking at, and the, the, the signal, the, the dip from the eclipsing binary, or the eclipsing binary star, so the binary star pair, where the two stars are in an orbit where they, they cover each other up from the line of sight from the Earth. Good question. You say you've got 3,000 candidates. How far are you into your mission at this point? And is there a hard end to that mission? Let me get to that. I, I am going to explain that. Um, so where was it? Oh, yes. So there's these things called we call false, false positives. Uh, there are a lot of them in, in sort of a raw extraction of, of transit light signals from the Kepler data. There's lots of false positives. And we do a moderately extensive check for consistency with the Kepler data itself to weed out many of the false positives. And then we also go in and go and do a ground-based follow-up observations to, to check out the consistency of the, the, um, the, the, the mass of the object that might be around the, the star that could be causing the the, the transit signal and, and a number of other things. So the, the, the large list of things that we publish are called plant candidates. And that list of 72 or 73 or whatever it was uh, of the Kepler plants are the ones that have gone through a thorough vetting process. And we believe there's better than a 99% chance that those things we call confirmed plants are actually plants and not one of these false positive as we So that's we think that of these 3,000 candidates, they've been checked out well enough so that 90% of them are expected to be real. Now, that's not good enough for us to call them real planets because we want 99% of them. So 73 of the candidates are confirmed to be these real planets, which have this high probability of being uh, planets. So yesterday, there were 776 total exoplanets known. There's still no confirmed planets in the habitable zone and that were also Earth-sized planets. Uh, now, many of the Kepler candidates and uh, three other exoplanets that have been discovered not with Kepler are possibilities. Whoa. By real planet, you just mean something orbiting a star out there. We mean something that we are, that is, that we are 99% convinced is a planet-sized object, planet mass object, not only orbiting one of our stars, but transiting in front of the front in front of the star. And we can't be completely absolutely sure that we got it right. So that's why we have this you know, 1% the 
we allow ourselves 1% error rate. So here's what the Kepler candidates look like as of our list of year 2012, which was this list of 2,312. We plotted this on a chart where the orbital period is in the days down here, and the size of the planet relative to the Earth is in the vertical axis, and we've marked off the sizes of some of the solar system planets. The features you can see in this are that there are a lot of planets that are between Earth size and Neptune size. We found a pile of those that were pretty, pretty sure 90% you know, of those are real. So it looks like real planets out there are favor this size of planet. And, and in particular, the, there are not so many big plants, and you get more and more plants as you get smaller. There's a hole down over here for two reasons. One, we hadn't been running, this is, this is I think, what, 10 months of data, something like that. So um, we were well, six quarters, six quarters, right? So a year and a half of data, which, which didn't let us get uh, these three or four transits that we need to make sure that, that we, we really believe that has a, a chance to be planned for periods longer than you know, 40 to 100 days. So planets out here are invisible to us yet because we haven't seen enough transits on them. Planets down here, as they get smaller, are harder to pick out of the noise in, in our, our photometry. So we don't know how complete we are down in, in this corner. We don't really know what's down there. We know that as, as the planet gets much smaller than uh, about two Earth sizes, you start having trouble picking the photometric signal out of the noise. So we think we're incomplete down here. So that, that's why this, this chart has the shape. It has increasing numbers of planets down here. We think we found most of these. So this, this peak in here, this concentration is real. But we're not so sure what's really going on in this region yet. And I've got a sort of an explanation or, or another way to show that here where this is a histogram showing how many of each kind of planet candidate we, we, we had there. Here's the big collection of planets that are Neptune size. So we believe that it's a real physical effect that the, the likelihood of, of, of the frequency of the planet is increasing rapidly from jupiter sized planets up to neptune sized planets. But we're not so sure that this fall off in this direction down towards smaller planets is real. We have to do more work and uh, more analysis to understand the incompleteness out here so we know whether this, this real curve goes up or flattens out or, or what's going on. Um, let's see. No, it's this way I want to go. I want to talk about how many plants we found in the habitable zone. Here I've replotted these, these candidates to make the um, to take into account the mass of the star, so you can convert the period plus the mass of the star into the distance from the star. And then you also know how bright the star is, so you can convert the, the distance from the star into how much radiation the planet's getting, and you can estimate its temperature. This equilibrium temperature means that this is the, the temperature a bare rock would have in orbit around the star at the distance that we, we, we calculate for this planet. Over here, and these are, these are Kelvins, um, water uh, freezes at about 273 Kelvin and boils at 300 degree Kelvin. Uh, zero Kelvin is, is absolute zero. So the habitable zone is down here between uh, around um, 250 degrees, no, no, excuse me, around 300, 320 degrees Kelvin. And I've got that region expanded here. Here we plotted the, uh, the, we expanded the scale of the, uh, the temperatures and it goes from 180 degrees, which is lower than the 273 that I claimed was the, um, the freezing point of water, because we believe we're looking for planets with atmospheres. And a planet with an atmosphere is going to have a surface temperature warmer than the equilibrium temperature because of the greenhouse effect. So we consulted with the, uh, the planetologists, the guys that, that think about you know, how planets form and how the, the surface temperature works, how the atmospheres work, and ask them, well, what would the equilibrium temperature be if we wanted the surface temperature to be between the freezing and boiling points of water? And this is the answer they gave us. This green zone is the habitable zone. 
And what you see is we've got, you know, 48 uh, plants um, that, that are, are in the habitable zone of their stock, but none of them, only one here is close, real close to the size of the earth, and there are not any smaller than the earth. And we put the earth in there just as a, a sort of a fiduciary one. So I'll come back to the habitable zone plants in a second. But this is the entire plant zoo that you will find on the, on the Kepler website. Lined up from the largest to the smallest with the plants in the solar system and the red boxes here, Jupiter and Neptune and Earth down there. And you can see that we've got a bunch of plants that are smaller than the Earth, but none of those are in the habitable zone. And now I want to show you uh, three or four of the details about three or four of the plants that we've confirmed. This is where all 73 confirmed plants are in the, in the Kepler field of view. Uh, when I made this chart, there were 61 of them confirmed by the Kepler team, nine from other astronomers, and three of them were known before Kepler. So the first one I want to talk about is Kepler 10. It is a scorchy hot planet. Uh, one, one, one and a half times the size of the Earth, about five times the mass of the Earth. It's definitely rocky because for this one, because we got a radial velocity orbit for it, we were able to determine its mass. So with these two numbers, we can get its density, which is way higher than you can have if it's got a, I don't know, a, a deep gas atmosphere. Uh, 70 times closer to its star than the Earth, with only a 19-hour <laughs> orbit uh, and a scorching hot surface temperature. Uh, another uh, of our planets is Kepler-16. This is kind of an interesting one because it's a planet that orbits both stars and a double star, kind of like uh, Tatooine and Star Wars. <laughs> so you would be able to see sunsets and, uh, and things like that with two stars. Uh, since this is a, uh, a kind of a big planet, the Saturn size, we expect it to be a gas giant. So there's no surface on this planet to go look at sunsets from. But if there were a moon around it, you might be able to see a sunset. Uh, another planet is Kepler 20. Uh, another, uh, excuse me, another star with planets is Kepler 20. It turns out there are five planets around this star, all of them transiting. We see transits from all of them. And I'll talk about our multiple planet systems uh, in a couple of more slides. The point I, I wanted to make here is that while three of these planets are big, like Neptune size or larger, two of them are as small as, as the Earth or a little bit smaller. So we can see planets that are as small as the Earth with Kepler. And I should also point out that this structure of large, small, large, small, large, small planet surprised the guys who think about the theoretical construction of planetary systems. We did not expect that. Uh, last one is Kepler 22. And it's interesting because it's not so much bigger than the Earth, and it's in the habitable zone of its star. 22b is two and a half times the size of the Earth. It's, it, it's, it's enough bigger than the Earth that we don't know whether it's got a rocky surface or not. We're working on measuring the mass of this planet to, to figure out whether it's a, a rocky planet or maybe it's, a, it's light because it's got a lot of water in it or maybe it's, it's got a deep atmosphere and, uh, and no, no surface usable for our kind of life. Last thing I want to talk about, well, I said last thing, are multiple planet systems. These are multiple transiting planet systems. This is an unexpected find. When, when the Kepler scientists went into the building and, and figuring out how to, how, to look at the Kepler, how to work the Kepler experiment, make these observations, nobody expected that we would find planetary systems where the planets were all of them in such a, a, a confined plane that you could see more than one of them transit. Uh, if, if there were more than one of them around the star. The, Earth, the planets around the sun are in slightly cattywampus orbits. So there's a very low probability that if a, um, a, a civilization on a distant star were looking at the sun from the right direction to see one of our planets transit, they would see any of the others. So this was a, a, a very pleasant surprise for us. We found more than 170 of these systems containing something more than 800 planets. Uh, so these things
Simpsons can tell us about the structure of the planetary systems as well as the planets, but more interesting for the immediate scorecard of, of, um, of confirmed planets, these multiple planet systems are self-confirming because it is very unlikely that you can get more than one false positive lining up behind a single star to produce you know, multiple planet systems without there being real multiple planets there. So we're working on a paper right now, uh, which should be coming out pretty soon. It's not five minutes over, I've got five minutes left. Okay. Um, we're gonna make, um, we, we expect to be able to confirm something like 800 more planets, say, I don't know, before fall. There are some details to work out on the paper, but Kepler is going to have a very large list of confirmed planets before very much fall. Um, this is a picture sort of showing the multiple planet systems that we found. These are the confirmed multiple planet systems. These aren't a whole 170. These are the ones that we're really sure is out there before we apply this business of the self-confirming um, issue. And over here is, uh, is what our solar system looks like as a multiple planet system. Um, here's a, a little uh, movie we have of all 170 multiple planet systems. The planets are all to scale to each other and they're going around at scale um, and scale speeds. And the orbits are all to scale with each other, but they are not the same scale as the planets. And those are the Kepler numbers that just popped up. Oh, one thing here. This was the time, let me run this again, see. This is the time in days up there, that, that BJD number, and, and shows you how fast the things are going on. So, we found many habitable zone planets, and we found lots of Earth-sized planets, habitable zone planets over here, Earth-sized planets down here, but no habitable zone Earth-sized planets yet. But, so, these are the, the planets that we have that are near Earth-sized in the habitable, excuse me, these are the candidates we have your near Earth size and the habitable zone. And we're working hard on confirming some of these. And why is this one most interesting, Steve? I uh, forgot. Uh, it's uh, small like the Earth. And, and these yeah. other guys are up pushing up to two and a half Earth radii. Yeah. yeah. So, where's Kepler going? Where are we headed? Um, we, the, the data that I've been showing you is a year and a half of data. We now have almost three and a half years of data. So we'll pick up more planets when we get done analyzing the, the latest data we have. We recently got a mission extension from NASA to let us go another four years to become more sensitive to smaller planets and more sensitive to planets in, in longer, uh, longer period planets farther from their star. So we're pushing down in sensitivity and time trying to look at the planets to go into this corner. So we're going to start filling in this blue area. And it's blue because that's sort of the, the habitable zone-ish type stuff. Um, pushing into this blue area as our extended mission data becomes, starts accumulating. And we expect even to get into this area where we have true Earth analogs, Earth-sized planets in the habitable zones around G-type stars like our own. And by the end of the mission, we expect to have a handful of, uh, of Earth analogs identified. And that's the end of my talk, so Steve's going to tell you about um, the astrophysics that Kepler's been doing, and I'm going to run his show. Okay.